Okay, we might do a quick sound check before we start. Can everyone hear, hear me okay? Yep, yep, okay, thanks, Jared. Okay, yep, thanks, yep. Sanjin. Okay, and uh, welcome to week six. So we're in week six for term. Okay, looking at our, our, our topics for this term, that's our topics. Uh, we've got, we're, we're currently in week six, so we're up to there at the moment. Okay, so we're going to be talking about more on objects this week. So we're continuing on from week five's discussions. Okay, and uh, next week's arrays, we start on arrays next week, and then we then we do a bit of GUI programming and so on. So um, we're, we're sort of at the halfway point or a bit over the halfway point at this stage. So two weeks ago, a long time ago, <laughs> we did um, the week five's material, which was all on using methods and classes and objects and loops and things like that. So we've done all that in week five and week four. And um, then we had the midterm break, so no classes in the midterm break. And my, my recommendation was that you try and catch up and get ahead with the work. <laughs> I, I hope, hope people managed to do that okay. And um, so just talk about the week five tutorial class video too. So that's missing at the moment. And there's been a lot of emails behind the scenes about this, a lot of, lot of hours chewed up, <laughs> a lot of testing of Zoom, uh, a lot of getting it to try and reproduce the issue. So it's been many hours of searching and uh, trying stuff to try and get it to do it again. But um, at the moment, the CQ Uni help desk are working on it and the Zoom staff are also working on it. They're trying to find the missing video files. So, um, Zoom's also going to include, or it's going to include soon, new functionality that allows you to record locally and to the cloud at the same time. So that means we shouldn't lose any resources then uh, from then on. At the moment, it's still only record to the cloud, but uh, hopefully record locally and to the cloud's coming. So that's going to be something that means we don't lose videos. And I'll have the videos straight away after class ends, not several days later. Okay, so week five, we, I guess we're going to assume week five's tutorial video is missing. Um, the, the Zoom staff still haven't found it, so I'm not holding out hope. So there's still Bruce Bruce's tutorial five videos on the course webpage. That's still there. And I've also got some textbook. I also worked through the week five textbook questions on, on my Mike's Java videos link. Okay, so... Um, all, all the materials work through. It's it's there. It's just not the class that we did in week five. Okay, so, so make make use of that those resources there. Okay, so week six, we're going to be talking about more on objects, so object concepts. What's an object? What does it mean? What's um, talk about static and 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 scope some more. Uh, we'll talk about the math class imports and local dates some more as well. Just covering all topics that we've done already that we'll talk about again. Although we haven't really covered static in depth yet, so that's really something we're still going to cover. Uh, well, I have talked about it in, in prior weeks, just not gone into too much detail yet. And we've also got a bunch of new topics. So overloading the this operator, what does this mean? <laughs> Shadowing, composition, and the hazard relationship. Okay, so we've talked about the, the ISO relationship in a, in a prior week. Uh, I think it was week five. And we're going to talk about the HASA relationship this week. Um, now, the coverage of this week's lectures for static is nowhere near enough, I, don't, I, I think. So I'm working on a new video, a new material, and that'll be, called, that'll be called something like static versus instance to explain and show you exactly what's going on. And that'll be on my videos soon. And he's, he's a sneak, sneak peek of, this, of the intro slide, it might change. And so far I've done about, uh, about 13 slides so far. So this is extra material I'm working on to help you out. Okay, so this, is, this isn't in, in the core material that's included with the course, this is extra material I'm doing to help you out. So like, like all my videos are, they're all, uh, they're all extra videos I just do because I want to help you out, okay, apart from the class videos. Okay, so we won't look at that now, but that'll keep an eye out for that video. It should be there, you know, tomorrow or the next day, probably, I'd say. I've got uh, probably about 10 or 15 more slides to go. I'm not sure how much I'm going to, how much I'm going to cover and how deep I'll go. I might do a part one and part two. I'm not, not decided yet, so. Um, okay, keep an eye out for that one. 
but we're now on this one. So week week six of slides for the uh, for the more object concepts. So any questions so far? We're only just getting started, but any any questions so far? We've got fifteen people with us, so that's great. Okay, all good. So, so we've talked about blocks and scope, but we'll talk about those again. We, we, we keep going back over things and, and going back in more detail. So we might talk about scope in week one and week two, and then we'll talk about it again in week three and week four, and then we'll talk about it again in week six and so on. So we keep going over things and uh, and covering in a bit more detail and also recapping what we've done. So because all these topics are building on each other. So we've got to keep everything in mind that we've learned so far. We'll talk about how, how to an overload a method. So a new topic, overloading. A very, very useful topic. And um, you couldn't do much without it really these days. And I'll show you what um, what it was like before overloading as well. I'll show you what we had to learn before overloading. So just to show you how great it is. We'll talk about how you avoid ambiguity. We'll talk about constructors, default constructors, parameterized constructors, multiple parameterized constructors. Okay, we'll talk about all those sorts of things, things this week. We'll talk about the this, the this reference, what that means. So it's a special keyword in Java. We'll look at static fields and we'll talk about those in more details, although not, not in much detail at all. Remember I said to look at the upcoming video that I'm working on. And also use automatically imported pre-written constants and methods. And we'll look at some, some classes again. We'll look at the math class again. We've looked at that already. And we'll look at math.floor and seal and sign and cos and max and min and all those sorts of things, absolute value. And we'll look at those again, just talk about, the, talk about them with some of our new knowledge. And finally, the last thing we'll do is we'll use composition of classes. So we'll use one class that includes other classes and that's called composition or nesting. Okay, so we'll nest classes together. So one of the first topic blocks, Blocks use opening and closing curly braces. There's just a block of code inside curly braces. That's all they are. They can exist within another block or entirely outside of and separate from another block. They cannot overlap. And so you're going to have inner blocks, outer blocks, or nested blocks. Okay. And up until now, we've really seen code that looks like this. So the if statement, we might have an if. And then we'll have an opening and curly brace. Or we might have a for loop or, or some sort of loop, for example, for whatever, and then we'll have an opening and curly brace, and we'll have some code in here. There might be one or more lines of code inside those curly braces. Okay, so each one of those is a block of code. And the if statement, unless there's a semicolon here or something funny going on with your if statement, the if statement ends at the closing curly brace. Okay, and unless there's a semicolon or something funny going on here, your for loop ends at that closing brace. Okay, so they're both blocks of code. But you don't need the for loop or the if statement. You can just start a block of code whenever you like. For example, you can just do that if you like. Okay. Why would you want to do that? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit later. Okay, so you can just start a block of code anywhere, opening and curly braces, and then just type in code where whatever you want. Okay, so why would you want to do that? We'll talk about this more a little bit later. So you're going to have blocks, inner blocks, and nested blocks. And we'll talk about those shortly. They cannot overlap. For example, you could not do this. Okay. So if you try to do that, <laughs> Java, Java would think that was the end of the if statement. Okay, because it's the closest curly bracket that closes that scope. And this would be the closing bracket, the curly brace, the for loop. So you've indented it so it looks like this is where the if statement ends, but that's not how Java sees it. Okay, so you can't have overlapping, overlapping blocks of code. Java will end one or give you an error if you try it. Okay, so keep that in mind. So that's what would happen if you try to do that. Indentations ignored. 
Okay, so let's talk about blocks and scope a little bit more. So we've got a number being declared here. And that number is declared, looks like at the, at, at the top of the method. So that 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 variable, that field uh, called a number has got meth method scope. Okay, so it exists in that line of code in which it's declared and until the closing brace for the method. Okay, and um, so if we try and use it here, in this print line statement, that's fine. It's just using whatever that whatever value a number has that's being used here. And then we've got a, a, a opening curly brackets and closing curly brackets. So we're starting another scope or another block of code. And we've declared int another number and set it to a value. Okay, so with scope is from the line of code in which it's declared until the closing brace for the scope in which it's declared or until a block in which it's declared. Okay, so uh, so another number exists all through here until that closing brace, and then it doesn't exist anymore. It's gone, it ceases to exist. So if we try to use another number outside that curly brace, after that curly brace, we will get a compilation error. Okay, so the field doesn't exist anymore. Okay, so we can, we can use a number anywhere from the line of code is declared until the closing brace of the scope in which it's declared. And we can use another number from the line of code in which it's declared until the scope in which it's declared ends, which is that curly, bracket, curly brace there. Okay, so it's nothing, nothing we've talked about so far is particularly new. We've talked about these sorts of things already. The thing we're talking about now that is new, that is you can just create a, a scope or a block of code whenever you like with it, with just curly brackets, whenever you like. And that's that's the new part really we're talking about now. So the scope is the portion of a program or a class within which you can refer to a variable or a method or some sort of object that's part of the class. Okay, and um, and variables and methods come into scope, they come into existence, and they also go out of scope again. Okay, so as we saw here, a number comes into existence or into scope, and then it goes out of scope when that curly bracket is reached. And another number comes into existence here and it goes out of existence here at that curly bracket. Okay, so what, what I've been saying to you all term about keeping your curly brackets in line and keep your code all neat, that becomes super, super important from now on because we're gonna be having lots of blocks of code and lots and lots of long classes and, and, and methods that are quite long as well. So keeping your code neat is really important so you can see where things start and end. And if we had a class, of course, and we talked, talked about this already, class employee, and so on. We had various bits of data in there and we had various methods and whatever. So all of these fields here are declared at class level. So these have all got class scope. So they're valid for use anywhere inside the class. Okay. If we had some methods and we had uh, fields or variables declared inside methods, then they would have method scope. Okay. And if they were declared inside blocks of code inside that method, they would have the scope of just that block of code. Okay. So keeping that in, keep, keep, keeping scope in mind is very important because you, you need to use scope to your advantage to write code and write programs to do something useful. Okay, so we'll talk about that more in coming weeks as well. You cannot redeclare a variable within the same block of code, and it would be an illegal action. And so, for example, here, we declared it here and here and here. So we declared it three times. So this would be invalid because it already exists, and this would be invalid because a value still has scope here. Okay, it's declared here, so it's got scope from that, that line of code until that closing brace. Okay, so A value still exists in here, so we can't redeclare it. If for some reason you wanted to use A value twice and you didn't want to use another variable name, you could declare it.
could declare it there and then declare it again in another block of code and that would be fine because this one here disappears when that ends and this one here disappears when that ends. So there's no overlapping scope or anything going on. And uh, so that, that would be quite okay. Okay. But, um, that would be an error and this one is okay. Okay, so you've got to keep got to keep your scope in, in scope in mind. When you use a field or variable, what's its scope? Where can I use it? When you declare a method, where can I use it? What's its scope? Okay. And this is something we'll talk about for the rest of the term as well. So bits, bits and pieces here and there. Any questions on scope or blocks? It's just sort of a, a, a quick recap, really. And the only thing we really introduced is that you can have you can have a block of code anytime you like. That's the only really new thing there. We've talked about scope uh, a few previous times. But any questions so far? Okay, everyone's fine. Okay, so override occurs when you use the variable's name within the method in which it's declared. Okay, so that sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? So let's talk about that. So in our employee class, we had a method that's with set name or something like that. Okay, and if the employee class field was called name, we could just say name is equal to a name. And, uh, and Java knows a name is that one, and name is our class field. I assume that's part of an employee class or something like that. Okay, so there's no, no ambiguity there, everything's fine. But what if we did this? And we just call that one name. So when I say name here, does Java mean I, does Java think I mean that one? Or does Java think I mean that one? Okay, so this, this is the ambiguity we're going to be talking about. How do you get around that? And the, the answer to that's a little bit later. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But for now, we'll just talk about another example. If we didn't do that, and we had a system dot out dot print line for some reason. <laughs> We want to display the value of name. Again, which one are we referring to? Is this name here, that one? Or is this name here, that one? So is it, is it the class field or is it the method field? Okay, and the answer is there on the slide. That's, that, that's, that's called shadowing. We've got the same field name here and here. That's called shadowing. And the locally dec declared variables always mask or hide the other variables within the same name, with the same name elsewhere in the class. So when I say system out print line name, I'm actually referring to the local one, which is that. Okay. So if you, if you do have shadowing going on, where you've got the, a class field and a, the name of a, a parameter in a method or a method header with the same name, Java always uses the most local one. So this name here would be that one. So how do you get to use that name down here? Could we use that name as well down here? And there is there is an answer to that, and it is yes, you can. And that's whether this operator comes in, but we'll talk, talk about more, that more shortly. Okay, that's coming up. So here we've got shadowing going on, where we've got locally declared variables, masking or overriding other variables. And, um, and so the local ones are used. I've, they, they, get, they get preference, they hide or mask the other ones. So if you hear the, word, hear, the, hear the term shadow variables or shadow fields, that's what it means. Okay, so here we've got some examples. And so we've got um, A number being declared up here. So A number is local to this method. It exists in that line of code until that closing brace. 
We also got a, a number being declared inside this method header as a as a parameter. Okay. And it exists in the line of code in which it's declared, or in other words, the start of the method, until it, until the close embrace for the method. Okay. And they're two separate fields. They both have the same name, but they're two separate fields. Java's got them completely separate in memory. This A number here is nothing to do with this one. They might as well be called them, they must well be called number one and number two. They're, they're completely different. Okay. They've got different scopes and everything. Okay, so system out print line in main A number is, and it should be 10 coming out on screen, A number is 10. First method, so we're calling first method here, which sets A number to 77. So this is declared locally inside this method. So its scope is in that line of code until the closing brace. So again, this A number has nothing to do with that one and nothing to do with this one. They're all completely separate fields. Okay, in first method A number is, a number, which should be the local variable A number, which is 77. Okay, so we should see in first method A number is 77. Back in main A number is, and there's only one A number in main, and that's 10. It's got the value of 10. Then we're passing A number through to the second method, second method A number. Uh, in second me method at first, A number is A number. Okay, so we're passing through the value 10. And then we're setting a number equal to 862. And in the second method after the assignment number, a number is, so it should be 862 on the screen. Okay, so we've passed through an a number. We passed it through here as, a, as, a, as an argument. It's been accepted into the method. We've changed the value of a number. We've printed it out on screen. But what would this be back in the main class? Can anyone have any, a guess of what this, what this would be here? Back in main, a number is, what value would we see? Would we see 10? Would we see 77? Would we see 862? Or would we see something else? So Wayne said 10. Paul said 10. Yep. Okay, I, I, like, I like your thinking, you're quite right. Okay, so this a number here we're changing, is this one that's local to the method. Changing a number to 862 is changing this field or, or, or variable name. It's nothing to do with that one. That's a completely different field. Okay. And that new value of a number and that variable a number here dies or ceases to exist at that curly brace. So back up here in the main method, we're talking about this one, which is a number with a value of 10. Okay. So We've got uh, multiple variables with the same name, but all with different scopes in this case. So it's overriding going on. Okay, so this A number is completely different to that one. And this A number here is completely different to that one and that one. They're separate fields. They must called number one, number two, number three. They're completely different. Now, what we did down here, we passed the variable through and so ints double boolean char and those sorts of fields, they're primitive types. And when you pass those to a method, the value is passed. Okay, so so the, if, 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 our, if our method changes the data in here, it has no effect outside of the method call. The original value hasn't changed. Now, when you pass reference types, you're not passing through the data, you're passing through the memory address. So if this method in here changed an employee, for example, if I declared employee up here, employee Mike equals new employee, and I passed Mike through to this method, so it was employee followed by employee, and I changed made changes to the employee in here, that would affect Mike. Okay, so for reference types, methods can change data in the, um, in the, in the calling method um, if, if you pass through reference types. So with reference types, you'll be very careful. If you, if you pass them to methods,
Ah, so strings are reference type. You're quite, you're quite right, Wayne. So strings, uh, so I've got some questions here. So let's just do the first one before I move on with this. So I've got a question here, question. So if a number was declared in the class, the result would be the same too. Um, if a number was declared inside the class. Okay, so if a number was declared here uh, as a class field, well, we're gonna come on to that because um, so we're going, to, we're going to think about this situation with, with a number. So if we had a number here declared as an integer, and we said a number equals whatever, and it was passed through as a parameter, yes, it would have the same effect. It would be the local variable getting changed, not, not this one. Okay, but we'll, we'll talk about this situation more coming up. Okay, and st strings are reference too. Okay, so, um, okay. so yes, it is. And, um, There's actually special properties for strings. We don't want to talk about them just yet. I won't go into that detail just yet. We'll talk about those a little bit later. But let's just do a quick example for now. So employee Mike, employee, might go Mike.setName to Mike. Oh. Okay, and then I might pass the employee, the employee through door method. Um, change your name, Mike. change your name to Frankie and inside that method the change your name method um, it would probably have a head look like this public static public void okay and in here we'd say emp dot set name to a new name So we're passing Mike through to the method. So this method's got to accept an employee. I'm just called it emp there. And it's also taking a string, which is our new name. And in here, I'm just going to go emp.setName to whatever new name is. So we did Mike.setName because Mike's an employee. So this, whatever this object is, an employee. So we just go emp.setName. So we then uh, did a system.out.println here and said Mike name what we see on screen my dog name so what we see Frankie that's quite right so Wayne's right there so Frankie we'd see Frankie on the screen okay so we've passed it we've passed an object through to our method and it's changed it okay so we just saw that when we did it with ints uh, if we had int a number equals 22 and we call change number a number public void change number int new number Whatever changes we make in here, it doesn't affect this guy. Okay, so it's a primitive. Type. It's a primitive type. The value twenty two is passed, not the memory address of the data. So twenty two is passed in here, and we say new number equals thirty four, which has no no effect at all on that. So we've got, we've got system dot out dot print line a number. It will of course still be twenty two. Okay, but when you get to reference types. You got to be very careful. If you, if you if you pass that object to a method, that method can change the data. Okay, and that's just a quick intro. We'll talk about that more as we go, and we'll talk about ways to prevent that as we go as well uh, later in this course in the follow-on course. Um, so you can make so instead of passing through the object, you can pass through a copy of the object, and, uh, and that's safe thing because if it makes changes to the copy, it doesn't affect your original. Okay, we'll talk about that sort of that sort of stuff later in the course or in the next course. Okay, so we're just talking about ints now. So that's that's really jumping ahead for uh, for reference types. 
So there's the output there. So a number is 10 in the first method, it's 77. Back in the main, it's still 10. In the second method, it's 10. But after changing, it's 862. And back in the first method, again, it's 10. Okay, so changes in a method don't affect the value in the original method, which is a main in this case, but it could be any method. Okay, so just keep those in mind for now. We'll talk about, that, talk about this a lot more as we go. Overloading. Okay, so one of my favorite topics is overloading. Overloading. So pretty soon we're going to be doing array lists and GUI, a little bit of GUI programming and things like that. And if I want to add a label to, so if I declare, declare a label, label, title, label equals new. We haven't done this yet. This is just jumping ahead. I'm just showing you some examples. Uh, equals new label, my app version 0 0.0001. I've declared a label. We haven't done labels yet, so don't panic. <laughs> okay, I'm just, just going to show you an example. But to add that label to the user interface, I go add title label. Okay, and if I need to add it to this a special region of the user interface, I could say add title label to a certain region. Again, we have an onboard layout, so don't panic. This is all brand new. Okay, but all, all I want you to look at is that I'm using the same method or the same name, add. Okay, pretty soon we're going to be doing menus and menu menus and things like that. So menu and uh, menu items. That one and if we've got a menu to add a menu item to it you just go my menu dot add menu item okay so add 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 pretty cool eh it'll become clear why in a second okay and pretty soon we're going to do it doing stuff with array lists and to add a, to add a string to an array list um, Okay, so we've got all these methods called add. Okay, and uh, how does Java know which one to use? Are they, are they different methods and how does Java know which one to use? And the answer is yes, they're all different methods. And how does Java know which one to use? Well, it looks at the context of the call. So here, here we're calling the add method and we're passing through a label. And if we're doing that in the right method in our, in our class, Java knows that we mean our user interface. So this, this means add the label to the user interface. So it'll appear on screen. Okay. And here, we, here we're using the add method and we're telling it to which, which region to add the, the, the label to. So we're saying the north area of the screen. So this will add the label to the north area of the screen. And here we're adding a menu item. So, so the type of data is a, a menu item and the context of the call is we're adding it to a menu. So Java says, okay, I need to use the add method that adds a menu item to a menu. So they're all different methods. Okay, and here we're using add and we're adding a string to an array list. We haven't done array lists yet, so don't worry. It's just an object that we're going to be doing later. And here we're adding Frankie to the array list. Okay, so Java again looks at the context. Okay, the add method's being called. We're passing through a string. So Java goes through its all, all its list of methods that, for the add that take a string and it says in the context of an array list. Okay, so they're all called add. But all are completely different. Java works out which one to call based on the context. What's doing the calling? And, uh, and, and what's being passed. Okay. 
Now, before overloading, let me let me show you what code looked like before overloading came in. Okay, so we'll take that those same lines of code. <laughs> okay, and add label to user interface, and add label to UI region. Okay, and add menu item to menu and add string to array list. Now I'm, I'm exaggerating this slowly, but it was almost this bad. Okay. And these of course aren't, aren't of course the original method names. It could have been whatever you wanted. Okay. So to, to, to now work with GUIs, we're going to remember all these methods, add label to GUI, add button to GUI, add checkbox to GUI uh, and so on. And if we want to talk about specific regions, we, we need to remember there's a two, two UI region or two GUI region method. And if we want to add menus to menu items or to menu bars, we're going to add menu item to menu and add string to array list. So what sort of code would you rather program? Would you rather just say add, 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 add? Okay. And let Java take care of the plumbing. Java, we get the context. Which, which add method to use? Or do you want to write code like this? Does, does anybody want to write code like this? Where well, you've got to remember a million methods? Or do you want to just write code where you just remember one method, add? Okay, I think the answer is pretty clear. Okay, so this is the old way. The old days. Before overloading. It's also called polymorphism, but we'll talk about that more as we go, polymorphism means many forms. Okay, so before overloading or polymorphism, this is what we had to do, this horrible, horrible code. We had to, we had to remember thousands of method names. And this is the new days. So the new days, all you have to do is remember a few method names, relatively few, <laughs> uh, and for example, add. Okay, so I don't think anybody here, would anybody here uh, rather the old way? <laughs> okay. So it was a huge change. Overloading and polymorphism came in in the, uh, well, it was really around about the early 80s when the, the compilers became widespread. And I've got to tell you, I got a bit choked up when I saw it. Okay, uh, I just thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. No longer did I have to, did I have to write code like this. Okay, now I could write code like this. Just add, 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 and away I went. Okay, so much simpler. Okay, so if overloading or polymorphism scares you or worries you, stop. <laughs> it's actually the programmer's best friend. It makes your code so much simpler. You don't have to remember a thousand method names. There's other benefits as well, we'll talk about a bit later. Okay, but they're the main two for now. Just remember, overloading polymorphism, don't get scared, it's your best friend, embrace it. Okay. So overloading, using one term to indicate diverse meanings, many forms, think about many forms. Writing multiple methods with the same name, but with different arguments or different uh, variables involved in the call. For example, it might be a menu or an array list or a user interface. It's convenient for programs to use one reasonable name because we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about remembering thousands and thousands and thousands of names. Okay, so I hope I'm convincing you that overloading and polymorphism are good things. Here's an example. We've got a calculate interest method and it takes in a balance and a rate and I'm pretty sure we talked about this back in week five or week four. And uh, we had a we had calculated interest that took um, 
a balance and a right or a, 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 yeah, a balance and a right. Another one just took a balance. Yes, we did. And then when, when you call the one that just took a balance, you pass through one double. When you call the one and, and, and it had a card coded or a, or a default right. And when you call the one that took a double and a double, then you, you could pass through the right and apply that right that you pass through. Okay. So, so we've already, we already looked at polymorphism and, and overloading. It's just a form of overloading. Okay, so with that example we talked about back in week four or week five, we could go calculate interest. $100, and that would apply the default rate. And we could calculate interest on in $100 at 0 0.35 or whatever. 35. <laughs> okay, so supply rate as well. So that's that's polymorphism in action. Got many forms of the same method. Okay, and which one gets called depends on context. If you pass through one one integer or one double, the one that takes one integer or one double gets called. If you pass through two integers or two doubles, the one that takes two integers or two doubles gets called. Uh, if an application contains just one version of the method, then the call, we call the method using the parameter of the correct data type or one that can be promoted. And don't forget Java does the automatic promotion. So doubles get promoted, ins get promoted to longs, get promoted to floats, get promoted, promoted to doubles. So if you've got a method that takes a double and you're passing through an int, Java auto automatically promotes it up to a double. Okay, so. 100.0 or 100.0, exactly the same effect. There's no method that takes just 100 on its own as an integer, so Java calls the one that takes a double. Okay, so here we're, here we're calling a simple method that takes a double. Method receives a double parameter. And let's create another method called public void. Simple method. I'll put, the, I'll put that one in as well. Double D. System dot out dot print line. Double. Okay. Let's do another one that takes a string. Method takes a string. Yes, we can display it as well. Oops. Display the value as well, just for, just for fun. And another one that takes a boolean. Boolean B. Okay, let's call the method. This is a simple method. Okay, so all, all three got the same name. So Java goes through methods that are in scope and finds one that takes a single string. So it looks at that one. No, nope, that takes a double. Aha, this one takes a string. I'll run this method. Java does this automatically for you. And we'll see the output on the screen. Method takes a string followed by Mike will be output on the screen. So I'm passing through Mike. Let's do another one. Here I'm passing through a double. So Java looks through our simple methods and finds one that takes a double, which happens to be the first one. Okay. So we'd see on screen method takes a double followed by the value 45.45. And let's do a Boolean. Okay, so we're calling it with a true. Java comes through our methods and goes, that one takes a double. No, nope, that's no good. That one takes a string. No, nope, that's no good. Aha, this one takes a Boolean. I can run this one. So method takes a boolean followed by true would appear on screen. Okay. And using the automatic promotion, 45, Java comes through and looks at our methods. Uh, that, that takes a double, that takes a string, that takes a boolean. 
But this one here, I can promote the integer to a double. So I'll run this one. So we'd see method takes a double, followed by the value 45 on the screen. Okay, to make sure everyone's keeping up, let's, let's do this one. Which method would get called? <laughs> and it's a bit of a trick question. Okay, so. That's right, it's a char. So I've used, I've used single, single brackets here or single, quote, single quotes, so it's a char. Which method? So which method gets called? So would Java auto, automatically promote a char to be a string? Ah, okay, so Wayne's asked that, so is char promoted to be a string? And it's not. So if we remember back to our week two, I think it was, and we talked about uh, primitive types, we had int and uh, long and short and byte, and we talked about char as well. And I, I didn't mention, but maybe, of course, it's, it's not gonna, you're not going to remember it, but, but char is actually a type of integer. Okay, it's a numeric type of data. So when you say char equals a with single quotes, it's actually storing the, the ASCII value for a, which is 65. So 65 would be stored inside char when you put an a there. So, really, Java thinks of it as 65, not not a not a not a string. It's certainly not a string. So again, Java will come through and look for a method that could take an integer 65, and that's that one there. They, they can promote it quite well. So we'd see method method takes a double, and it'd be 65 on the screen. Um, view, clip library. Yep. So there, there we can see in the, there's our ASCII tags in the clip clip library. And uppercase A's got a value of 65. And, um, okay, so. So that's, that's overloading. And polymorphism in action. Polymorphism in action. This means many forms. Okay, so good good question there from, from Sanjin. Okay, so question. So if I said char equals 65 and system out print line char, would it say A? And it, and it would. Okay. So when, when you print line a character, Java tries to convert it into a something you can understand, not, not, not an ASCII value. Okay. Um, so yeah, we'd say, say A on the screen. Uppercase A. And if you wanted the lowercase A, um, that's stretching my memory a bit, but uh, there they are there. So they start at 97, the lowercase letters, 97. So if you said char A equals 97 and print lined it, it would say lowercase A on the screen. So, so before we move on, any questions on overloading or polymorphism? So here we're mainly talking about polymorphism, okay? Overloading is really reserved for constructors. We'll talk, talk about that more in a second or later on in this, in this lecture. Okay, polymorphism, usually you use the term polymorphism when you're talking about general purpose methods and you use the term overloading when you're talking about constructors in a class, okay? So, Polymorphism, so usually for methods, and that's usually a term used for constructors. But I don't mind if you use them interchangeably. Overloading polymorphism, they just mean many forms of the same method. So really they're the same thing. I don't, I don't distinguish between them necessarily. But uh, overloading is just for constructors. No, because you're overloading methods as well. I don't really mind that you use that terminology. Uh, any questions so far on overloading polymorphism? And like I say, think of it as your best friend. Because otherwise, if, 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 
if if um, if polymorphism overlapping didn't exist, we would have to call this simple method that takes a double, and simple method that takes a string, and simple method that takes a boolean. Who wants to type all that? Who wants to remember all that? Okay, so simple method, much easier. One name. Okay, I hope I'm convincing you anyway that polymorphism is a good thing. So you can have ambiguous situations when the compiler cannot determine which method to use. And that, the compiler will just give you an error then, saying, uh, uh, you know, can't pick a method or can't, can't find a method that uh, can take this value. Can, cannot find a unique method that can take this value, for example. So overload methods, you correctly provide different parameter lists for methods with the same name. So double or a string or a boolean, or you could have multiple parameters. You could have one that takes a string and an int and a float. Another one takes a string and a double. Another one takes a double and a string. And you could have multiple methods all with the same name, as long as the parameter lists are, are different. Okay. And you can have as many as you like. Legal methods are ones with the same name that I, I have identical, uh, identical argument lists or different identical data types that can be passed through. And it doesn't matter about the return type, return types are relevant. So it's all on the, the types of the parameters being passed through. So if I have this, my method, and that takes a string, I have another method that called my method that takes a string and a double and I make that an int, Java won't allow it. Okay. You've got two methods that have the same parameters or same parameter types. It doesn't matter whether you call this um, name and temperature or whatever, it doesn't matter. They've got a string and a double and they're both called my method and that's illegal. Java automatically provides a constructor. Oh, okay. So back onto constructors and classes again. And um, let's go grab our employee class we talked about earlier. Employee class. Oh, there wasn't much code there. <laughs> so normally, normally our classes are public, so I make it public. That's public. And don't forget constructors are public followed by the method name. Sorry, by the class name. A public followed by a class name. Now you might have another constructor that take in, took in a string name. And in here you might have bits of code. Okay. And you might have another constructor that takes in just, a, just an integer for ID. Okay. And you might have another constructor that takes in and a string and an, and an int. Okay, so we've got three constructors that take parameters, but the parameters are all different. One takes a string, a single string, one takes a single integer, and one takes a string and an integer. So we can create employees multiple ways. Employee one equals new employee. E2 E3 E4 Okay, so you can see we can create employees multiple ways. If we don't pass any parameters into the, into the method call for creating an employee, this, this constructor here gets called the no parameter constructor. It's also called the default constructor. Okay. And if we pass through just a single string, then this constructor here gets called 
and that's called a parameterized parameterized instructor. Okay. And then we pass through one that's for this employee here, E3, we pass through just an integer. So Java comes down, looks for your list of constructors, find one that finds one that takes just a single integer and calls this one. And that's also a parameterized constructor. And then we've got this one that takes through a string and an int. So Java looks down your list of constructors and we've got one that takes a string and an int. So it invokes that one. So that's another parameterized constructor. Okay, so we've parameterized constructor number one, number two, and number three. And we've got a default constructor. These, these constructors are automatically called when you create an employee. And which one gets called depends on the, the values you pass into the constructor. What if I try to do this? Oh, okay. So, so a question for people. Why have multiple constructors? Another question. Is this valid? Who'd like to have a have a guess at why we have multiple constructors or see if you can tell me if that's valid? I'll keep it on the chat window. Or, or speak if you want to speak. We've got 15 people in the chat still, so there's a lot of people there. Okay, so Sanjin said it's going to return an error. Jared said it won't be in order, so that's quite right. Um, so for this one here, an integer and a string, Java's going to look through a list of constructors. That's the default. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. No more constructors. Okay, I'm out. That's it. It's an error. <laughs> okay. So if Java can't take it, find an int, uh, find a constructor that takes an int and a string, it'll just give you an error saying that's it. I, I can't help you. Sorry. Suitable method cannot be found. Suitable constructor cannot be found. And the, 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 the more important question is why have multiple constructors? And it's all about flexibility. So providing flexibility for people that are using your class for other programmers or providing flexibility for yourself for using the class or for your users that are using your class objects. For example, if we've got a, if we're, if we've got a data entry screen and the user types in the name and the employee ID, then we could call that one. Okay, if they know both bits of data, we could call that one. Okay. If they know the name, but they don't know the employee ID, it's a new employee just starting. They haven't got an employee ID yet. We've got to wait for payroll to get organized. Then we, they just type in the, the name and we could call that, in, that constructor there and that one will get called. Okay. We don't know what the employee ID is yet. Well, we know it's the name. So we'll call the one that, that has a name that gets assigned to it. The only alternative to that would be to call the one that takes a name and an integer and just pass through a value of zero or minus one or something to indicate it's not known. Okay, that's not as neat. Okay, we're, pass, we're, we're, we're passing through data that the class might accept, might, might assume is valid. Okay, but this one, by using this one, we can say, all we know is the name. That's all we, that's all we know at this stage. Or we might have an employee that's starting now, there's been a real rush and they needed this employee and they, all they know is the employee ID and we don't know their name yet. They've, they've started work, but we needed them straight away. It was an emergency, our servers were down. We needed them straight away, but we know it's the ID. And so the user types in their ID in the data entry box, doesn't it leave the name blank? And then we could call this constructor here that just assigns the ID. Okay, we'll fill in the name and all the other details later. The employees start of work. We need to be able to let them into the building and assign them a key tag and we need to start paying them and whatever. So we'll worry about filling in the other details later. Okay, so it's all about flexibility. Flexibility, okay. Providing options users of your class. That could be other programmers, other applications, or the end users. You're making it easier for users to create employees. All that providing options. If we had a game, and I'll come back to games because everyone can relate to games more. If we had a game, uh, game world class, okay, 
and we wanted to uh, new floor equals new game world. We pass through a texture and we pass through the height above the above the above the ground. Okay, that might that might allocate a, a new floor object to our game world. We're passing through the, the texture to use and the level of the floor in the, in the game world. So now the now the floor's been set. Java knows that's a floor that's been set. Or, or our class knows. Java doesn't know. It's our class that knows. And if we add, add another one, add player and Mike. And we've got uh, 100 hit points, and they're located at 40, 40 on the map, and whatever. Okay, so we can we can make we can make this flexibility work for us. So the game world might have multiple constructors, or the game objects it might be game object, not game world. So here we're adding a floor. Here we're adding a player. And we might add a monster. Let's add a monster. And they're called um, Ripper. <laughs> I don't know. And they've got a thousand hit points. And they've got a gun that shoots 15 bullets a second. And they've got um, uh, that they're immune to fire. Which pass through false, which indicates. They, they can't be attacked by fire and uh, and whatever okay so you can see, you can see this thing works well for us if we're, if we're creating game objects we could have multiple constructors there and pass through the data to create the game world for us that's all we're doing here just flexibility here, here we're using a flexibility because we might not know all the data here we're using it for flexibility because we might be creating different objects in the game world That might be going, that might be going a little bit too too far. But uh, I'm just showing what we what you can do. This is all about uh, peeling back the layers of an onion. <laughs> okay, so we'll just go back to this slide. Java automatically provides a constructor method when class created default constructors do not require parameters. Bit strange that one. Okay, so the the rule, rule to remember is this: as soon Java provides a default constructor automatically, your classes, unless you provide any type. Okay, so if you provide any parameterized constructor or default constructor, Java no longer provides a default constructor for your classes. So if we get a class that looks like this, Public void, public void, and public string, get name. So if our, if our class had no constructors, Java would automatically provide a default constructor for us. Now we'd never see the code. Java does it automatically for us and puts it into our dot class file as we compile our code. It's in the class file. We'll never see it inserted into our code. And that sets, and remember how data is initialized in, in, in Java automatically? So not numeric fields are initialized to zero. What are Booleans initialized to? What are strings initialized to? And what are reference types initialized to? 
okay, think, think's fine. So we've got a false there. Boolean to, to false. Uh, strings are initialized to... Anyone remember? Yep, null. Beautiful. Thanks, Wayne. And reference stops initialized to null as well. Okay. So if you're happy with that, and you don't need any constructors, any parameterized constructors, just make do with a Java default constructor. Okay. But I tend to always create a default constructor because if you display someone's name and it comes out on screen as null, it looks pretty horrible. Okay. Or if you try and use a string, the, the, the field in an if test, you're trying to compare something to null, which is illegal, and your program will crash unless you handle it. So I think it's always better. So my, my rule is, always provide your own default constructor, constructor and at least one. That's sort of the rule I recommend you, you, you follow. So provide your own default constructor and at least one parameterized constructor. Provide many if you need to. Up here we had many parameterized constructors. One, two, three, and, uh, and so on. If we had more data items here, we could provide more constructors. Okay. As many as it makes sense. If, if people never know the name and not the ID, then you wouldn't provide those two maybe. Okay. So it depends on how people want to use your class and what makes sense. If people always know the employee's name and always know the ID, you might delete those two and just have that one. Now provide, provide what makes sense for your class and your class users. Uh, writing your own constructor, you can ensure that fields within the class are initialized to values that you like, not nulls, but spaces or blank or whatever you like. Uh, and constructors can receive parameters and they're used for initialization purposes when you set up the objects. So initialize the person's name and their age and their whatever. You, you will, when you write a constructor for a class, you no longer receive the automatically provided default constructor. So that's this, what I was talking about up here. Java, Java provides a default constructor for your classes unless you provide any type of constructor and then it's all bets are off. Java says, right, you're on your own now. You've, you've written one constructor, you can provide the others as well. Why, why do they decide that? Well, just what the, de the, the Java devs decided. Uh, if a class's only constructor requires an argument, you must provide an argument for every object of the class. So if you provide a, const a parameterized constructor, there's no more default constructor unless you provide it. Okay. So let's just clarify that. I think we're pretty well, pretty well agreed this one's okay, but would this one be okay? Keeping in mind what I just said. Let's look at the slide again. When you write a constructor for a class, you no longer automatically receive the provided default constructor. Java no longer provides it for you. If the class's only constructor requires an argument or multiple arguments, you must provide an argument for every object of the class or multiple arguments for every object of the class. Okay, so we've provided a constructor. So that one's okay, but this one's not. This one, I'll give you a compilation error. Okay, there's no more default constructor. As soon as you provide a constructor, Java no longer provides the default one for you. So keep that in mind. Uh, 
construct a parameters to initialize field values or for any other purpose. Um, so you might be opening files, reading data from files, connecting to databases, all sorts of things you can do in a constructor. It's basically anything you want to do when you create an object of that type. So um, for, for, the, for what we do in our classes, it's going to be pretty simple stuff like just initializing class fields. But that we could be reading files, we could be connecting to databases, we could be doing all sorts of things. Okay. If the constructor parameter lists differ, there is no ambiguity about which constructor to call. And that's what we had up here. We had different different parameter lists. Okay, so different arguments being passed through, and we had different constructors that could take those parameters. Okay, so they're all they could all be uniquely identified. So there's an example of using a employee class with a constructor or two constructors. What sort of constructor is this one? What's, what's the word for it? A parameterized. Thanks, Wayne. It's the same people answering question, <laughs> questions all the time. There's, it feels like there's only one, one or two people out there. The other 13 people are fairly quiet, but that's okay. As long as you're here and, and, and learning, that's fine. And this one here is our default one. Okay, there's no parameter, so that's our default constructor. Now, there is a bit of a, something naughty going on here, and you should put public in front of your constructors, public followed by the class name. No return type, no void, nothing. Public followed by the return, by, by the class name and public followed by the class name. You can get away without providing public, but um, uh, I, I, want, I want you to get in the habit of providing public for your, for your constructors. What would happen if we put private in front of those? Private there and a private there. What would that mean? Would our code compile? And would it work? So if our constructors are if, if our constructors private, So, so Wayne, Wayne said there, you, you couldn't create a new, a new object based on a class. So that's, that's quite right. So if the constructor is private, we can't call it because it's private. We're not allowed to call it. It's a private method. We can't call it from outside the class. So that would be illegal. That would be an error. Okay, so keep your, keep your constructors public is the best thing for us at this stage. Instantiating an object from a class, memory is reserved for each instance field of the class. It is not necessary to store a separate copy of each variable and method for each instantiation of a class. Um, I think cross out that second sentence there. Memory is reserved for each instance field of the class. Just, just remember that, that, that second sentence there. Uh, I don't like what that's saying. Um, in Java, one copy of each method is stored in a class is stored. All instantiated objects can use one copy. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll just give you a quick, a quick look at the slides I'm working on for the static versus instance. Because it, it says me drawing the same example again. Camtasia. Okay, so here I'm declaring a bank account object. Bank, bank account Mike saving equals new bank account. And I'm calling the deposit method. And I'm set, declaring another bank account object called Mike's turn deposit. And I'm calling the deposit method for Mike's turn deposit. So I've got two accounts, Mike's savings and Mike's turn deposit. And each, each account's got its own ID, name and balance. And there's a default constructor, a deposit method and a withdrawal method and a get balance method. And no validation. I'm just trying to keep things simple here. So no validation. So you can withdraw a negative amount, which makes your account deposit money. And you can deposit a negative amount, which makes you withdraw money. So there's all these sorts of issues going on. I'm not worried about it. Okay. okay, so let's have a look at how these look in memory. Mike's savings and Mike's turn deposit. And uh, so my, when you say bank account, Mike's savings equals new bank account, 
Mike gets his own copy, or Mike's savings account, gets its own copy of all the class data and all of the class methods or class instance methods. So he gets his own deposit, withdrawal, get balance method, and also his, his own fields for those values that can be stored for a class object, ID, name and balance. And Mike's 10 deposit gets its own copy of the data as well, and also the instance method. So it's like a self-contained unit there that is some Mike's savings and another self-contained unit for Mike's 10 deposit data and, and methods. So when I say Mike's savings dot deposit 100, I'm, I'm calling that deposit method. Okay, for Mike's savings, and I'm depositing $100. Okay, so $100 would be in my balance. And when I say Mike's turn deposit deposit 3345, I'm 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 calling that deposit method, and I'm passing a value 3345. So that would be 3345 there. Okay, so two completely separate areas of memory, one for each object. Okay, so methods in reserved for each instance field of the class, and it's also reserved for each method of the instance instance method of the class as well. It is not necessary to store a separate copy of each variable and method for each instantiation of a class. I mean, that's just wrong. Just put a line through that. I don't like that sentence at all. Okay. A reference is an object's memory address. So if I, if I printed out Mike's savings to the screen, remember we saw the, the class name, it'd be class name ampersand followed by some strange hexadecimal number. And uh, that's the memory address of where that data is. And so if I print out Mike's send deposit, I see bank account for the type of data, ampersand followed by the strange hexadecimal number, which would be where this data lived or where this data and these methods lived. Um, and it's automatically understood without being actually written um, that it's a memory address. You don't have to worry about that. It's just where the data lives in memory. Okay, so the this reference, the this reference. <clears throat> Any questions so far on constructors or anything we've done so far? Any questions? Okay, everyone seems okay. Let's do another topic and it's this. And I'll tell you up front, you can't do much work at all from here on out without understanding this. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's a really, another really important topic. And let's go back up here to our... Okay, Okay, so remember we talked about this example earlier, and I'll take that out. And we had a set name method that took in a name, and it, down here we said name equals a name, and that was nice and clear. Okay, a name is the local variable for the method, and name is our class field. Okay, so that's nice and understandable. The problem is they're different names. So if you, if you did a research and replace some name that was case sensitive, you wouldn't necessarily replace those and it would, you could end up with a bit of a mess. So I like using the same name. So I like doing it this way. So string name, and then I say name equals name. But when I refer to name here, Remember our rule that we talked about earlier? Java uses the most local version. So when I say name and name, it's referring to this one. 
So how do, I, how do I refer to the class one? And that's where this comes in. So if you say this.name, it's the same as saying that chap, I'm referring to that chap. And name on its own refers to this one, the local field, local variable. Okay. So whenever you put this in, this in front of something, it means or the current class object. Okay. So if ever you need to clarify what field you're referring to or what method you're referring to or what object you're referring to, you can always use this. Okay. So I think this is much nicer code than that code. And it just means you've got to put this in front of it to say the class field, okay? But if now name changed, so it was now called uh, person name or something like that, we could just replace all name with person name and be done with it. We wouldn't have to worry about looking through and finding a name and a name and fixing up the case and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so this is much nicer code, much nicer. So this, the, it's a reference to an object that's passed to any objects, non-static class methods, and it's a reserve word in Java. So this is a, this is a non-static class method. This is a non-static class method. So they all have access to the this, which means to the current class object. So they could say this current class object's name is equal to the name passed to the method. You don't, you don't need to use this reference in most of the situations for, for this course, but you might also get in the habit of it because we'll be using it a lot in the follow-on course. And, um, but we're appropriate, we're appropriate, get in the habit of using it. So here, here we've got a, a, a method called get employee num. And what sort of method is that? What sort of method is that one? Remember the correct name for that? What sort of method is it? And, uh, and so we've got one here that returns empnum, which has got to be a class field because it's not declared here and it's not declared inside the method. So we've got to assume that's a class field. Or we could say this dot get empnum and it means the same thing, but we're just clarifying that we mean a class field called empnum. So the silent majority out there, the, the 13 people that are being silent, Anybody, anybody remember what sort of method that is? Is it a mutator? Um, I'm looking, oh, yes, so Wayne, Wayne's got it there, Wayne's got it. So it's a, it's, it's, it's an accessor method, okay, or a getter. So accessor, or getter. Remember those from week, uh, week five? <laughs> and then we had mutators. Uh, which were also called setters. That's sort of the friendlier name for them. Okay, and that's methods like set name. All those sorts of methods are setter methods or mutator methods. And feels to just get the name, get the name, get the balance. All those sorts of methods are accessor methods or getters. They just retrieve class fields and return them back to the calling method. Okay. So they're both accessor methods or both getter methods, whatever term you like to use. For this reference, it's implicitly received by instance methods, implicitly. So we're not passing it explicitly. We're not saying, we're not passing this inside round brackets. It's just there, it's there available automatically. So it's automatically available. In other words, it's implicitly available. Um, it's used to make classes work correctly. You can, you can do this sort of thing. Okay. When used with a field name in a class, the reference is to the class field instead of the local variable declared within the method. So this dot name means class field, that chap up there. A name with nothing on it, nothing before it, is the local variable name.
Ah, okay, so you can also do some good stuff with this method call. Okay, so let's have a look at that. We'll go up and we'll grab our employee class that we used up here. Okay, so in here we might have ID is equal to zero, name is equal to that. Okay, and in here we might have this dot name is equal to name. Now we know about our, how this we can use stewed ID here, which is much better. Stewed ID. And as soon as you start using this, you might use it for all fields. Just make it really clear. Okay, so when I when I call the default constructor, everything gets set to zero or, or, or blank string. When I call the one that takes just a, a name, set employee ID to zero or minus one or whatever you think is a valid value, and set the name to whatever they pass in. So this dot name. When you got when you call the one that takes just an ID, an integer, set this, the class field ID to student ID and set the name to blank. And uh, when I call the one that takes both bits of data, set the data accordingly. Okay. Now there might be validation going on in here. We might be doing validation. You know, if student ID is greater than 100 and it's less than 2000 and it hasn't been used before. Any other student? And for name, we might have rules like If name is not blank and it is three characters and starts with an alphabetic, okay. So we might have we might have a whole lot of rules in here. For student, we might have rules like that, and for, for employee name or employee name, we might have rules like this. And so we have to apply the rule here. Whenever name is changed, and here, whenever name is changed, okay. And for student ID, we might have to apply that rule here. So it might be a big bunch of if statements, and also here because it's also changed here. So we've got the same if statements in multiple places. So how can we avoid that? Let me show you a shortcut. Okay, so I've reduced all that code, which was if statements and if else's and all sorts of things and error messages. I reduced it all down. So it's only in one method now. So the default constructor now calls a constructor in this class that takes a string and an int. So it calls this one. This parameterized constructor number one calls a method that takes a string and we're passing through zero as a student ID. So it calls this one. And this constructor here calls a constructor that takes a string and the student ID that was passed in. And we're passing through just a blank string for the name. So that might validate our, violate our rules. So I'm not be getting error messages for that one. So maybe you might have to say there to be advised or something. Okay. <laughs> and maybe zero is not allowed. So maybe you've got to set it to minus 30, minus one to indicate not known. So, uh, minus one equals to be advised or something like that. Okay, so, you, so it allows some minus one here. So you want to pass through minus one and to be advised here. Just make sure these if statements are passed. Okay. 
Okay, you can see. So whatever the, whatever the nightmare of code in here, is in here, just validating two fields. Okay, if we had many fields, we'd have lots of code. But whatever the nightmare of code is in here to validate those two fields, we don't have to repeat it in multiple places. We can just call the same constructor in multiple places. Okay. So that's another great use of this: is that we can use it to invoke our other constructors. Okay, so this, this in terms of constructors, that's all those things. Okay, so keep these little shortcuts in mind. They're very, very useful. And we'll be using them from now on and throughout the follow on course as well. Okay, so you don't want to repeat, you don't want to repeat whatever codes inside here. You don't want to repeat it up here and up here and up here and up there and there and there. You just want to have the code once. More efficient, less error prone, no repeated code. Any questions on that? Using constructors, using the this operator for calling other constructors? Any questions? So keep that technique in mind, it's super useful. If you're keeping a summary of useful snippets of code, put that in there. Okay, it's going to save you a lot of time hunting for it later. Okay, so here's, here, here it is again. So here we've got a student class that has the parameterized constructor, parameterized constructor, parameterized constructor, default constructor. And then we've got the same class, but we're shortening it down by using the this, op, the this uh, operator to call our other constructor. So we're, we're, we're using them all to call this constructor here. Passing through a, an, an int and a double. Int and a double, int, double, int, double. Any questions on this? So it just means for the current class object. So you can use it to refer to class fields and also you can use it to invoke other class, other constructors in the class. So it's super useful, super, super useful. Okay, static fields. Static fields are, okay, so there's instance methods. Instance fields, and there's class methods, also called static methods. And there's class fields, which are also called static fields. Okay, so when I, when I go private int ID, that's an instance field. When I say uh, public, when I say private int uh, get ID, that's an instance method. Okay, so I've got instance fields and instance methods. Now we've been using static, we've been using a static method all term. Can anyone tell me the name of a static method we've been using all term? Yeah, the choice of working from home. <laughs> Actually, it's great because I've got my doggies here and I'm happy. So that's wonderful. I wish I could take them to class. Uh, so any, can anyone tell me a, 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 a static method we've been using all? Oh, system out print line. Yes, so system out the print and print line are static methods. Um, yep, so, but it wasn't the one I was thinking of. So system dot out. Print line, so we don't have to declare a class object to use print. We can say class name, device name, method name. So what's another static method we've been using all term? 
been in all of our classes, or all of our runner classes, our tester classes. What about our main? Okay, so we go public, public, static avoid main, and so on. Bella, bella, bella. Oh dear. And, uh, and class fields. So we're, we're seeing static methods. And these are interesting sort of things. They, they, uh, they are not instance methods. So if you wrote a static method, it couldn't, it couldn't get access to ID. Or if there was a name, for example, private string name. Okay. So any, any static methods we create cannot get access to those fields because these are instance fields. And instance fields can only be accessed by instance methods. Okay. So when you've got static, static methods, like main and, and print, they can only use static data. So static data. Um, we haven't really... Cr we created some static fields earlier on in the term because um, we hadn't enough Java to create instance fields yet. So if I declare a field as static, private, static, uh, int, student ID, that would be fine, student, because it's declared as static. Okay, so class methods can only access class fields and instance methods can access instance fields and also class methods and also class fields. So set instance methods can access and static methods can access Okay, so you might be wondering at this stage, why have both? Why not just have everything as instance? And for most of the stuff we do, everything will be instance, okay? But there are things where static becomes very useful, either as data or as some methods. Okay, so we've seen one static method we can't live without already, and that's public, public static void main. Without that, our program won't run. We're gonna have it somewhere in our code that we're running. And, um, but we haven't seen a good use of the static field yet. So that's what my, that's what these slides are all about that I'm working on that should be ready in the next couple of days. Okay, so I'm going to do a big talk about that. But let's just proceed with our lecture for now. So class methods do not have access to this reference. So there's no this. Okay. And they have no object associated with them. Okay, so class methods are or static methods are sort of a strange beast. They might seem strange for now anyway. Uh, class variables are shared by every instanti instantiation of a class. Class variables or static variables, class fields, static fields, these are like uh, shared by all class objects. They're like global data. Okay, so when I created Mike's savings account or Mike as an employee, uh, before we saw that Mike had his own area of memory where the class fields lived and the values for Mike. But um, these, these static fields are shared amongst all class objects. So one class field is shared amongst all class objects. So if one class object changes a static field, every class object gets those changes. Okay, it's, they're, all, they're, they're all using the same field, the same area of memory. Okay, so think of them like global data for all class objects. Only one copy of a static class variable per class. Okay, so it's not a copy per class or per, per instantiation. It's just one, one, one copy for the class. If you have an employee class and it's got static fields, there's one copy of that data. There's, there's static fields created in memory.
And that's it. We've got one slide on that. So that's, that's where this is going to come in useful. So keep an eye out for that in the next few days. Okay. Um, constant fields. That's what we say on static. Gosh, there's so much we could say. Okay, constant fields are declared with the final keyword, and that makes it unalterable. You, 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 you can declare constants at class level, and we've done that, and you just put a final in front. And you can also declare final or constants fields inside methods. So final int num is equal to 99 or whatever, or max. Okay, now normally with constants, you make them uppercase, and that just makes it really clear that there are constants. And if you've got multiple words, you can put underscores between words. Okay, max. And that's constants. We've done those already. Um, they can be set in the they, they can be set in the class constructor. After constructor, you cannot change the field's final value. So you can declare constants when they when they're declared. For example, at class level. Okay. They can do them like that. Or else, if you don't don't know what the value is until the the object's constructed. You can, uh, you can set them into constructor as well. This is a little, uh, little uh, overrider, if you like, that Java allows you. So if you don't know the constant value of the constant at, at compile time, you can set it in the constructor. And that's the only place you're allowed to change. You're allowed to change once. So if you don't set the value here, you can set them in the constructor and then you can't change them again until you, until you rerun the program. So they were, they were hard coding the values, student IDs, or school IDs, one, two, three, four, five. So there it is, it can't be changed. So that's static data. So there's one copy of that field for all class objects. So if I, dare, if I declare a thousand class objects of type student, yeah, so once you said there's more on static fields in the textbook, that's quite right. So always do your extra reading. That's quite right, 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 right. So There's more on static fields and static methods in the textbook. So definitely have a read of that. But I've also got some extra slides to help you visualize it coming up. Um, um, ID. So that, that's a static field that's created once for all students. So if I create a thousand students or a million students, there's only one copy of that school ID field because that's a static field. It's only one copy of it. So um, any, any, any student object can access it. For example, none of them are. I could say school is and then go school ID and it would say one, two, three, four, five in the print line statement there. Okay, if it wasn't a final, it was just private static int, I could also change school ID in any of these methods. And then if another class object tried to access that student or tried, tried to access that field, that static field, it would get the new value. Okay, so it's one field held for all class objects. And of course, you can have many, as many static fields as you like. If you've got five static fields, there's five fields that are held once for all class objects. Okay, so that's always, always we've got one slide on static. That's not enough. That's why I'm doing this extra stuff. So you just keep an eye out for that. Okay, so you can automatically import pre-written constants and methods. And we've done import statements. Um, Many programs are commonly, many classes are commonly used by a wide variety of programmers. Package or library of classes, a folder that contains or provides a convenient grouping for classes. Many contain classes available only if they're explicitly named within a program. Some classes are available automatically, for example, in all of our programs. The string class and the system class and the lang class are available automatically. So it's a whole bunch of stuff that's included automatically. So we can use ints and, str and strings and doubles and floats and booleans. But we can't use dates, we're going to do an import for dates. And we can't use scanner, we're going to use it, do an import for scanner and so on. So some things are there automatically, the most common things, and the rest we've got to import. So the Java Lang package is automatically imported into every program and that includes all of the fundamental basics that we use. And optional classes, if you need anything else, you've got to do an import for it. The Java Lang math class, we've looked at that already a couple of times. And that contains a lot of useful stuff. There's constants there for pi and e, and also methods to do absolute values and floors and ceilings and sines and cosentans and exponentiation and square roots, maximums, minimums, all sorts of things. 
in a math class. And it's a, it's a class of static methods. And how do we know that? So there I'm calling the absolute value function, math.abs, passing through a value of minus five, which is gonna return positive five. So I know, that's a con I know that's a static method because I'm calling it with the class name. So if I want to have a guess, guess what that method looked like, it would be public because I'm calling it from outside the class. It would be static because I'm calling it for the class name. And it would be called an int. It's returning an int because that's what I'm getting back is an int. And it would be called abs and it would take in a value of an int. Or whatever you want to call it. So I'm quite confident that's what the method would look like. Now, if this is a, if this is an instance method, not a static method, I would have to declare an object of type math. So if, if this is an instance method, I would have to create an instance of the math class and use the object to call the method. So you can tell a lot by how you call the method. If it's class name dot method name, it's a static method. If it's object name dot method name, it's an instance method. Okay. Object dot method name. If it's a static method or a class method, then it's class name. So you can tell what it, you can tell what sort of method something is just by how it's called. If it's called for the class name, and you don't have to you have to create objects based on that class, it's a it's a static method or a class method. If you have to create objects of the class, and then use that object to call the methods, then they've got to be instance methods. Okay, so you can tell what sort of method something is by how you call it. And um, so they don't need to create an instance; they're imported automatically for every Java program and um, you cannot instantiate the math class. So if you try and do that, that'll be an error. Okay, if you try and do that now, but um, if, if I'm saying that if math class in methods were instance methods. Just doing a hypothetical there. Hypo hypothetical, yep. Okay, so the, the constructor for the class method is private. There's actually a constructor there, but it's private. <laughs> okay, which means you can't call it from outside of the class. So if, so if it needs to instantiate anything to do with maths, it will create it when it needs it internally. Okay. There's some of the math functions, there's many more. Absolute value is one you're gonna use a lot. Ceiling and floor are two of my favorites. They're great methods. They give you the next whole number above or below what you've, you pass in. Um, max and min are pretty common. Power, raising something to a power. Random numbers. Remember, we, we talked about those random numbers in the prior week, and I, I told you that they were really weak random numbers. Don't use those uh, if you're doing anything important. Use a secure random class that I showed you in the prior week. Uh, rounds, quite common too, round. And then if you do some sine, cos, and tan, there's arc sine, arc cos, arc tan, sine, cos, tan, all sorts of things. So if you're doing any, any games where you're rotating shapes and rotating objects on screen, you're gonna be using the sines, cos, and tans like crazy. Okay. 
if you need to import cl classes that aren't imported automatically, you can, you can use the entire path with the class name, or you can import the class, or you can import the package that contains the class. So there's three options there. Let's do an example. So that's importing the package and then using it. Well, that's, that's importing the class and using it. That's importing all of the package and using it, all of the util package. And then the other way is to do this. And you have to worry about any imports at all then. <laughs> okay, so there's option one. option two and there's option three and that applies to everything that we're going to do so this is called a fully qualified reference because we're telling Java where the package lives and what the class is this is bringing in all of it all of a, a package which is fine Java's got an optimizing compiler so it strips out anything that's not needed from your class file and here we're nominating what we're actually bringing in we're nominating the actual class we're going to use so out of those three options, I like number one the best. And this one here's the worst. Because it makes your code really messy. Okay. Because later on we could be doing things like uh, java.awt.event.actionListener. So you don't want to be declaring everything with all those keywords there. The wildcard symbol you can use, like I just said, um, local dates. We talked about local dates in a prior week and one of the two questions especially. And they're quite cool, local dates. Um, let's have a little example. So you can declare a local date for today's date and time. Local date today equals local date dot now. So you don't use the new operator with local dates. There's no new. If you try and put new there, you'll get an error. Okay. And uh, local date graduation date equals local date off. <laughs> Hello, annotator. <laughs> local date off. And uh, you can pass through a year, a month, and a day. They've got to be in that order. Okay. So local date's quite easy to work with. Do an import java.time.localdate or java.time.star. Okay. You can also do things like um, prompt the user to enter a, a day, month, and a year. Create a local date based on that. Local date of year, month, and day. And then do this plus days, minus days, plus hours, minus hours, plus weeks, minus weeks, all that sort of stuff. And here we've got two weeks of delivery as a constant. So you can go order date plus weeks two. And that, that'll give you the date in two weeks time. So you can say the order date is that, and then the delivery date is whatever it is in two weeks time. So that's the beauty of using local data. It's got all these beautiful plus methods and minus methods. And you can also compare dates and all that sort of stuff as well, really nicely. So local date, it's a great class. So have a go on local dates. And one of the prior weeks we had a two question, which is on that. And I think we did talk about it in another two question as well. One last topic, composition. We're running out of time quickly, so um, I can't blame Bella. <laughs> I was gonna try and blame Bella, but not. Not going to blame them. So composition is when you've got classes made up of other classes. So then we then talk about a has a relationship. So an employee has an address. An address might be another class. An employee has a start date, and a start date might be a local date, which is a, which is another class, uh, and so on. So you've got this has a relationship going on. Uh, this is an example. So private name and address. Name and name and name add is name and address. So this is another class we've created. So school has got name and address objects in it, and so on. And down here where we've got a we've got a parameterized constructor. It takes in the name and the address and the zip code and the number enrolled. Okay, and the name the name the address and the zip code 
are used to construct a name and address object, which is our name add. So name add equals new name address, name address zip code. So the first three parameters here, we're passing on to the name and address constructor. We're not using them locally inside this method directly at all. Okay, we're, just, we're just passing them on to the other constructor, the other class constructor. And the only, only one we care about here is the enrolled, which is our enrollment. Enrollment equals enrolled. And then we can go display the school information um, system, name, name add dot display. So we're calling the display method inside the name address class. Name add dot display. And it's saying enrollment is followed by enrollment. Okay, so here we've got composition going on. This is the first technique we're going to use to is to combine our classes together to get them to do more than we originally developed for them. Okay, so it's all about making things more powerful, building up more, more powerful data types, reusing what we've already done. So now school makes use of another, another class, another class, which is our name and address. There's no code for that one, but I'm, I'm sure we could figure that out in the tutor if we need to. Name and address, it's got a, a constructor that takes in the three, for three values, and it's got a display method, so it's not going to be very hard to write. So that could be something you do for your, your to do, student to do. Create a name and, I create the name and address class and, and type that in and see if you can get it to work. Good practice for you. If, if anyone has trouble, we'll do it in the tube. Um, so unless the classes are a class within another class, stored together in a single file, here we've got, a, here we've got composition. A class object is contained inside another class. So that's composition. But um, you also have nested classes as well, where the whole class is contained within another class. Um, so nested class types, you can have all the fields we've talked about, all the things we've talked about. So you can have static members, non-static members, uh, local classes, anonymous classes, all sorts of things like that. Um, oh, gosh, and that's it. Okay, so let's, let's look at an example of a, of a nested class. Public class employee. And it's got the usual stuff. So on, and we also want to have another class in here. So we want to have a class gray or uh, training. And then we'll have things to do with the employee's training history. So on, okay. So here we've got a class inside another class. So this is, this is an asset class. And that's quite okay in Java. You can have classes inside other classes. Um, and uh, you can do all sorts of things. <laughs> Actually, I, I won't go too deep, but you can do all sorts of crazy things. It's not as bad in C and C++, uh, but uh, Java lets you get to do some pretty powerful stuff, some, some pretty complex stuff. So, Unfortunately, that's all we do this week, and we're out of time anyway. So have to think about that. We've got the tube coming up on Friday. I'm still trying to track down um, with the uni help desk and the Zoom staff, trying to track down week five's missing tutorial class that we did on Friday, the Friday before week in week five. But uh, don't don't wait on that. There's uh, tutorial videos on the course webpage. And I'd already done all the check textbook questions in Java videos on my YouTube there. So have a look at those. All the week five stuff's already done. I did it back in week three. Okay, so. I don't think this video is going to turn up. I think it's gone. Um, anyway, thanks for coming along. 15 people still here. That's pretty good. We, we made it right to the end. Any questions before we head off? Any final questions? Okay, everyone's happy. Thanks for coming along. Have a nice day. Stay safe and see you Friday.